Bienvenue. Et qui était un plaisir pour moi d'être ici et pouvoir frapper la langue française. Mais avec mon terrible accent, mais dans cette occasion, je vais juste détruire la langue anglaise. So, well, I want to tell you a story of three worlds, indeed. Uh, come on. Europe, beginning of the 19th century, which was identity, the main identity of any European person, was it, his her real community. According to Hosbaum, who was one of my favorite historians, a normal European person in the beginning of the 19th century, during the Napoleonic War abroad, only met 100 different faces in his her whole life. 100 less than we are here in the whole life. But in this world, it was quite easy to know who were you and which was the meaning of your work, which was the meaning of your life. Because, you know, you were the man making the iron for your neighbors, and you were the priest giving counsel and control, and also your neighbors, or you were, you know, the peasant producing uh, milk or, 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 the, or the vegetables for, for eating for the people you love and you know. But in the 17th century, the first globalization started, and something happened. You could buy by the very first time uh, things that were produced thousands of kilometers away in America. And on the other hand, uh, probably you move uh, towards uh, a city. And well, in the city, the division of labor is not the kind of, of division of labor in mean, a small and factory town. So your identity, the real community that surrounded you, cannot explain the meaning of your work, cannot explain what you do for your community. So a new kind of identity started to emerge. This was the national identity. We develop a national identity as a necessity for telling us who we were in a first globalized capitalistic world based in the industrial revolution. The world was rethink as a puzzle with little pieces that were the states, the states equal nation and the whole world like a, a sum of all these little pieces that were also little separate original identities, national identities. But at the end of the, of the century, of the 20th century, something happened. The first thing was in the 80s, the world discovered that the socialist world was having a huge crisis. Why this huge, huge crisis? Well, indeed now, in the perspective of time, if you look at the so-called socialist world, what they were was a big scale, scale capitalism. You know, uh, only one or two producers for everything, a high scale, over scale organization. But this is a trick in the beginning, you know, uh, is good enough for exiting from the third world. But when technology improves, every new technology makes smaller the optimal size of the enterprise, the optimal size of resources you need to allocate for having an efficient production. So the East was a big collector of inefficiencies. But this was happening too in Europe and the state. The big corps were much and much inefficient. And as you have seen in the, in the presentation before, it's still happening. 
you know, comparing these big hotels with Airbnb, you know, the uh, Airbnb has no scale, but very, very little scale, but has a very high scope that is very different scope from scale. So what the government, the government did for helping the big corporations to survive to this crisis that we are seeing in the East? What they did is that what we call neoliberalism, basically two kind of policies. The first policy was financialization. You know all, we are suffering a deep and terrible crisis in Europe because of it whose objective was to wipe the market. Why? Because in a wider market, an um, overscale organization is a little less overscale, is, is closer to its optimum. Second, they open the barriers, they open the trade barriers. That's what is renowned as globalization. And come on, the Okay. Okay. In 1994, here in Europe we have Maastricht, and they have the free uh, trade agreement in the, the NAFTA in the states Canada and Mexico. And, and what happened then? Uh, Corps are not stupid. Probably they are evil, but they are not stupid. They were very aware of its own overscale. So what they did, one thing that is called the breaking up of the value chains, which is this, is to take the production, to divide the big firm, the small units, and take the production to the places where were where cheaper to produce. In the beginning where their own industries, in the beginning where their own plants in, the, in, in another countries, but soon they started to divide the production between a lot of small firms or independent firms around the map and making the collaboration through a, a hierarchical collaboration which end with an apple, with an American product who was built around the whole world. Okay, during this time, in the 90s, is happening another very important thing, and it's called internet. And, well, internet means the ability to uh, communicate, collaborate with people all around the world, to make networks uh, without uh, centralizing points, without centralizing nodes. And there was another very important change, low-cost companies. Low-cost companies means that in the 90s, by the very first time, if you come from the middle class in a country like Turkey or East Spain, not for speaking about Taiwan or even China, you can travel. And if you find something interesting in the other part of the world, you can afford to travel there and meet the people. That was a dream. When I was a child, when I was a child, taking a plane was something very expensive in the Second World, or even in the Mediterranean Europe, was not affordable for every, uh, everybody. And then these two phenomena also collide with the very first signs of global activism. And it, it was not uh, uh, it was not you know hazard that that the first global activist movement were the protest against the World Trade Organization in 1999 in Seattle, and this organis uh, this uh, protest were the first protest uh, organized through the internet, uh, which mobilized thousands of people through fly. Uh, uh, through low-cost flights. More importantly, also in 1994, a platform called Alibaba was born. What is Alibaba about? Alibaba is a platform of all these small companies producing pieces for the big, uh, gigantic corporations, 
making a change, saying we can produce by ourselves, so we can sell by ourselves. And we can sell with our name, with our trademark directly to the to the central market. So the globalization with the objectives that the big corporate world gave to globalization became a globalization of the small. This globalization of the small is probably the most important social and economic phenomenon in the last 200 years. And this is why China is now the main economy in the world, because of this uh, economy of, of uh, uh, small globalized firms. An example, the Bubusela. Do you remember the Bubusela in the, the World Soccer Championship in South Africa? This horrible sound? Do you remember that? This was the idea of a Chinese entrepreneur watching for a documentary about the hunting of monkeys in South Africa. And he said, this is a horrible sound. If I can't produce it in, in plastic, we're going to sell millions. But his small, uh, his tiny um, atelier only could produce, well, in total, I think he made 60,000 of them. But was immediately copied by many, many, many other ateliers. And the result was this global phenomenon of the Bubusella with, uh, with, uh, and many little uh, enterprises, how they were sold through Alibaba and other networks connecting these Chinese stores you can see all over Europe and Latin America directly with the producer. So uh, Alibaba probably is the most successful experience in B2B commerce that we have now and has been one of the main vectors of this globalization of the world. Now that we, the central peoples of the world, the Europeans and Americans, are discovering the possibility of making this, we call it, like my friend Rob Rowe says, a direct economy. And we are very hopeful about that, but this is not a new phenomenon. It was born in the 90s, and the result is China. Now, the second story. At the same time, in the central countries, we discovered the internet in the 90s. And we discovered the, the, the global conversation, especially in the countries like France or Spain or Britain, who has an imperial language. So, you know, you discover how close was the people living in Argentina if you were Spanish. And probably uh, you discover that Mexico is closer to your home than is France, because you can speak in the same language and take, uh, and take part in, in common conversations. And communities were, a new kind of communities were, were born, conversational communities, and everybody loves them. Why? First of all, because if you compare it with the, with the communities, the traditional physical communities in the small towns we, uh, I start with, well, first of all, it's very costly to run away from your town. It's really costly. You have to lose your job, you have to lose uh, everybody you know, so, well, I was born in a little town in Northern Africa, so leaving the town was my dream, but also has a cost, and I'm still paying it. And second thing, you can choose the people you're with. In, in, a, in a physical community, you, you, you cannot choose the people you are related with. So, we love conversational communities, and conversational communities are also um, transnational, so you give you a lot of diversity and you can learn a lot. But have one problem, you cannot work in your conversational community. Or not. You know what? 
in the beginning of the of the 2000s, many companies, small companies, especially linked to free software, started to produce using this network method. They were all around different countries, and they produced everything that was intangible: software, design, books, contents. And we are not talking about a phenomenon of a small, a tiny things without real representation in the economic world. We are t uh, talking, in example, about uh, uh, you will know probably uh, PHP. Uh, I'm sorry, PHP. Um, MySQL. MySQL was sold by 3,000 million some years ago. So it, it was a big company, but it was yeah, 16 people in 60 people in 16 countries around the world working through that computer. And it was this kind of empowered virtual community. And what is, and that's very important to say, they are transnational. They have more passports than people, as my cooperative has, you know, that many of us have two or three passports. And these people coming from the free software and the creative industries, you know, they don't, they don't, we don't used to accept hierarchies. Because it's just your creation, your personal, individual creation that creates a value. So they are democratic enterprises. Many of them are cooperative. The majority of them who are not cooperative work as, as they were cooperatives. So, the third and final story. The crisis, the crisis arrived. Arrived because of the, it was from the very beginning, with the overscale of big corporations. And the state had to make the choice between uh, supporting social cohesion or to cut it. And this is a very centralized model. It's called the welfare state. You know it very well here, France. But the choosing of the state, bonjour, monsieur Val, is to cut it. And social cohesion is destroyed. So many people in many places of the world, and tomorrow we will speak about them, are questioning why not to come back to the community, empower economically the community, empower the community with networks, and to fill this void lived by the state. Why not to work with other communities in democratic manage, uh, manager, manager uh, economic empowered communities? And that's it's what is called filet. The question is that we are not fighting the state. The, pro the enemy is not the state. The enemy is that in the void left by the state, Every time the, the social cohesion disappears, what appears is global mafias, terrorist movements, and all the decomposition of the system. So we are fighting decomposition, we are not fighting uh, capitalism. We are fighting decomposition, we are not fighting the state. We are trying to build something different. And just as a last word, and because I'm in France, I only could say, Beef Uber.